Good evening, everyone. I'm James Patrice, and welcome to the fabulously festive surroundings of the Mansion House. Over the next 12 nights, the Lord Mayor, Hazel Chu, and Dublin City invite you to come inside, sit back, relax, and enjoy a Charles Dickens classic, A Christmas Carol, all in aid of the Mansion House Fuel Fund. So join us each evening where a new familiar face will read a passage from the story and we get to know the tale of Ebenezer Scrooge as he's visited by three spirits. So sit back, relax and enjoy. Hiya, good evening to all of you watching at home. I'm Ray Darcy. It's time to nestle down wherever you are in your bed, you can cozy up by the fire on the sofa, or maybe grab yourself a hot chocolate as I read you the beginning of the Charles Dickens classic, A Christmas Carol, which starts something like this. Stave one, Marley's ghost. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it as well. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. This must be understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. Scrooge never painted out Old Marley's name. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both. It was all the same to him. Oh, <laughs> but he was a squeezing, grasping, scraping old sinner. The cold within him froze his features, nipped his pointed nose, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and he didn't thaw one degree of Christmas. Once upon a time, on a dark Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was biting weather, and the fog poured in at every chink and keyhole. The door was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's poor fire looked like one little coal. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was Scrooge's nephew. He'd come into the room, you see. Bah! said Scrooge. Humbug! His nephew's breath smoked in the cold. Christmas? A humbug, Uncle? You don't mean that. If I could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. The nephew answered, Don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Bah, humbug. But why, cried Scrooge's nephew, why can we not be friends? Merry Christmas, uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. And a happy new year. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. His nephew even stopped at the outer door to wish season's greetings on the clerk. There's another fellow, muttered Scrooge, who overheard the exchange. My clerk, 15 shillings a week, and a wife and family talking about a Merry Christmas. Humbug. Scrooge's nephew had let two other people in. They bowed to him. Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago this very night. Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen. A few of us are endeavouring to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. What shall I put you down for? Nothing, said Scrooge. I don't make merry myself at Christmas and I can't afford to make idle people merry. They can go to the debtor's prison. Many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing that it was useless, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge went back to his work. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness and biting cold thickened. One cold young boy stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol. But at the first sound of, God bless you, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay. <laughs> Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog. At length, the hour of shutting up arrived. Scrooge nodded to the clerk, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all the day tomorrow, I suppose, said Scrooge. The clerk observed that it was only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket. Every 25th of December, said Scrooge. 
be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed and the clerk ran home as hard as he could. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and studied his banker's book, went home to his gloomy house. The yard was dark and the fog and frost hung about the house. Now, the knocker on the door was very large. Scrooge had seen it every night and morning. But tonight, Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face. The eyes were wide open and his greyish colour made it horrible. As Scrooge looked, it became a knocker. But he did look cautiously before he shut the door. There was nothing behind the door, so he said, poo poo, and closed it with a bang. Come back tomorrow to hear what happens to that mean old Mr. Scrooge. You don't want to miss it. Seems to hear words of good cheer from everywhere, filling the air. Oh, how they come, raising the sun. Oh, hell and death, telling the town. Gaily they ring while people sing songs of good cheer. Christmas is here, don't be very tears. How are you? And welcome back to the Mansion House. I'm PJ Gallagher. Yesterday we were introduced to Ebenezer Scrooge and his penny pinching, bah humbug attitude to Christmas. When we left him, he'd just seen his old partner Jacob Marley in a doorknob. Uh, where his eyes deceiving him? Let's read on and find out. He walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Sitting room, bedroom, all as they should be. Nobody under the table or under the sofa. Nobody under the bed or in the closet. He closed his door and he double locked himself in. Put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap and he sat down before the fire. It was a very low fire. And each smooth tile on the fireplace had an image of old Marley's head on every one. Humbug! said Scrooge. He glanced upon a disused bell that hung in the room. As he looked, this bell began to swing, softly at first, but soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. It seemed an hour. The bell ceased, and he heard a clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and then he heard a noise coming up the stairs, then straight towards his door. Humbug, said Scrooge. It came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. The same face, the very same, Marley. The chain Marley pulled was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent so that Scrooge could see the two buttons on his coat behind. What do you want with me, said Scrooge? Who are you? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. The ghost sat down inside the fireplace as if he was quite used to it. You don't believe in me, observed the ghost. Humbug, I tell you, humbug. At this, the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook its chain. Scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hands before his face. Asked the ghost, do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge. I must. But why do spirits walk the earth? And why do they come to me? It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death and is doomed to witness what it might have shared on earth and turned to happiness. You are fettered, said Scrooge, trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it, link by link and yard by yard, and of my own free will I wore it. Scrooge trembled more and more.
Would you know, pursued the ghost, that the chain you bear yourself was full as heavy as this seven Christmas Eves ago? You've made it longer since. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor, but he could see nothing. Tell me more, he said, imploringly. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give you, the ghost replied. But you are always a good man of business, Jacob faltered Scrooge. Business, cried the ghost, wringing his hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy and benevolence were all my business. I'm here tonight to warn you, pursued the ghost, that you have yet a hope of escaping my fate, Ebenezer. You will be haunted by three spirits. Eh, uh, I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. Expect the first tomorrow, said the ghost, when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night, at the same hour. The third upon the next night, when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. When it had said these words, the window raised itself a little. The spectre floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. They and their spirit voices faded away. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say, hum, hum, humbug, but he stopped at the first syllable, and he went straight to bed without undressing, and he fell asleep upon the instant. There you go. Come back tomorrow at the same time to find out what happens. And good night, everybody. Hello and welcome back to the Mansion House. I'm Lisa Hannigan and I'm here to tell you what happens next to mean old Ebenezer Scrooge. Last night he was visited by the ghost of Jacob Marley, who was now bound in the chains he forged in life. He warned Scrooge that he would be visited by the first of three spirits when the bell tolls one. Let's find out if he was telling the truth. Stave two, the first of the three spirits. When Scrooge awoke, it was dark. The chimes of a neighboring church struck and Scrooge remembered all of a sudden that the ghost had warned him of a visitation when the bell tolled one. The hour bell sounded with a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant and the curtains of his bed were drawn. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, I tell you, by a hand and Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them, as close to it as I am now to you. It was a strange figure, like a child or like an old man, diminished to a child's proportions. Its white hair hung about its neck and down its back, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it. Its legs and feet were bare. It wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand and had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? asked Scrooge. I am. The voice was soft and gentle. I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past, inquired Scrooge. No. Your past.
Scrooge asked what business brought him there. It put out its strong hand and clasped him gently by the arm. Rise and walk with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather was bad and the bed was warm. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. They passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. Now it was a clear, cold winter day with snow upon the ground. Good heaven, said Scrooge, clasping his hands together as he looked about him. I was a boy in this place. He was conscious of a thousand thoughts and hopes and joys and cares long, long forgotten. Scrooge wiped away a tear and begged the ghost to lead him where he would. You recollect the way? inquired the spirit. Remember it, cried Scrooge. I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years, observed the ghost. Let us go on. They walked along the road. Scrooge recognising every gate and post and tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance, with its bridge, its church and winding river. Some shaggy ponies trotted towards them with boys upon their backs. All these boys were in great spirits and shouted to each other until the broad fields were full of merry music. These are but shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. They have no consciousness of us. The jocund travellers came on and as they came, Scrooge knew and named them every one. But why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas as they parted? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? What good had it ever done to him? The school is not quite deserted, said the ghost. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Scrooge said he knew it, and he sobbed. I think if you can hear me. They soon approached a large house, its windows broken and the many rooms poorly furnished, cold and bare of food. They went, the ghost and Scrooge, to the back of the house and a long bare room with lines of desks. At one of these, a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire and Scrooge sat down and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he used to be. He said, poor boy, and cried again. I wish, Scrooge muttered, looking about him after drying his eyes in his cuff, but it's too late now. What is the matter? asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge. Nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something, that's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waved its hand, saying as it did so, let us see another Christmas. Tune back in tomorrow for the next part of the story. Good night. Yes. you're all very welcome um, to this evening's um, Christmas Eve evening 
with Bodega 695 and the Little Museum of Dublin. Um, to the Irish Times subscribers who are joining us at this series for the first time, you're all very welcome. It's really very lovely to have you here with us. Um, so our first guest joining us this evening is um, John Wilson, so Irish Times writer, author of Wilson on Wines, and as one of your Irish Times colleagues described you to me earlier this week, just a truly all around nice guy. John, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> a pleasure to, to come here. Um, so it's, um, it's really lovely to have everyone joining us in and I'd be really curious to know where people are joining us from. So please do type into the chat function and give us a sense of where everyone is this evening. And of course, if anyone's got questions for John as we go through the evening, please do type them in or indeed for any of our guests. Um, but John, I'm gonna jump in and ask you a question and just start us off. Um, so we will talk about wine, but before we do that, I'd love to get a sense of the man behind the pen. So I'd love to know from your own background, you know, did this love of food and wine, did this come into your personal life or your professional life first? I, I think my personal life, uh, but it took me a long time to realize that I should actually make a, could actually make a living out of it. Uh, I was brought up in, probably an unusual house in, in Ireland in, in that day in that I had a father who drank wine, largely because he was a French teacher and he couldn't afford it. So we'd have it sort of once a month. I remember we would drink Vieux Sepp, which had this sort of plastic cap and he would give us French style, the tiniest little bit that we could add water to if we wanted. Um, but more than that, my mother was a great cook. Uh, and she was quite inventive. She'd been to France with my dad, and so she used garlic. And garlic in Ireland in the 60s and 70s really wasn't used at all. Um, so, I mean, I, I think I gave my parents a huge amount of heartache because at the age of 16, I wasn't doing terribly well at school. And my dad brought me down to Cattle Brewer Street and said, this is it, you can leave school, you can go and train as a chef. Uh, but every chef I talked to said, don't do it, John, don't do it, uh, because you will never have a social life and the work is terrible. So I didn't. So I sort of muddled on. And when I left school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I'd always enjoyed history. So I went and studied history. I left college and I'd still no idea what I wanted to do. I knew what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to do accountancy. I couldn't do law. Uh, I had no mathematical brain. So it took me a while to realize that wine, which had been growing, because I couldn't drink it really until I was 18, that was this fascinating combination of history, of culture, of food, of wine. Um, so that's what got me hooked on it. Um, that's, um, and that, that's fascinating. It's, it's wonderful to hear the backstory and the journey, which started perhaps at history at a younger age and evolved naturally over time and um, I, I kind of in preparing for this evening I was mindful that my, my first instinct was to was to ask you about you know what wines should I be pairing with my turkey with my Brussels sprouts with my Christmas meals that I'm preparing next week and then I kind of um, I assumed that that's probably a question you're asked at great regularity um, so instead I was kind of thinking if you want to pair the wines with anything, I'd be very curious and please by all means do. But instead, I've picked a couple of wines that I'd love you just to talk to us a little bit about. Um, so each of the wines that we're gonna talk about this evening are on the online fine wine shop, Bodega 695. But the first wine I'd love to ask you about is the Carmen Grand Reserva, the single vineyard, the Carignan, which I, I understand is a grape with quite an interesting backstory. It does. I mean, it's it's fascinating in that it comes from Spain originally, where it's known as Carignana. Uh, if you go to Sardinia, they call it Carignano. And Sardinia was ruled by the Kingdom of Aragon for 400 years. So you can see how it moved there. And then it moved into the Languedoc because in the Catalan part of the Languedoc, would have been ruled by Aragon as well, I think. So the, in France, they call it Carignan. And it was sort of one of those grapes that people hated. And it was always uh, 
criticized as being sort of a workhorse grape because it needs a hot climate. It produces wines with lots of color, lots of tannin, lots of acidity. Um, and if you take too much of a yield, it actually is not a great grape. But what they've discovered, and it's been grown in Chile for hundreds of years. Chile has some of the oldest original grape varieties there. The Carignan that we have here is 70 years old. It's from some very old vines that were planted in the Maule Valley. And, you know, Chile fascinates me because it's sort of known for doing very good, easy drinking, good value wines. Yet it has all of these little bits of history. And we talk about New World. Well, New World is 400 years plus. So long before certain parts of Europe were planted with vines. So Carignan can do really well there. It produces wines that have a little bit of that Carignanism in terms of color and tannin. But if you get it with a couple of years age with low, low yields from old vines, you can have a fascinating wine. Um, arguably more original in some ways than the original uh, Spanish grapes. But uh, we leave the ampelographers to argue over what is the original one. Um, but it's certainly it's not a newcomer from the 1980s or 1990s. And We're talking with, with the, the, this wine from 70, 80 years ago. And so this wine or, you know, what sort of flavours and textures and tastes are we getting? Well, what you get from this, because we've got a 2014, is quite a lot of sort of earthy, developed aromas and flavours to it, which sort of adds layers of complexity to it. But you certainly get, um, I can see great colour in this. Um, and you get these lovely, soft, but still still quite acidic sort of damson fruits, I would call them. Um, I think it's the sort of, I mean, I always, people ask me about what's your favorite wine. It tends to be the last one I've drunk because there are so many different wines. I wouldn't drink this wine every day of the week, but I wouldn't drink any wine every day of the week. Um, certainly during lockdown, I was ordering caseloads of wine from different people and, and buying them as a journalist, we do buy our favorite wines. But after a night or two of drinking something, I'd say, I fancy something else tonight. Um, yeah. Yeah. Diversity is definitely important. And um, I just see here we've guests joining us from Churchtown, Kilkenny, Cork City. It's, oh, it's wonderful. It's lovely to see people coming in and let us know where you're all from. So thank you so much. Um, and I think kind of uh, as we're all coming together this evening from within our own homes, it really makes me curious, John, you know, I'd love to know a little bit about the Wilson family household and what, you know, what Christmas traditions you might have. Is there any stories that you might share with us? Uh, well, I always, uh, but this year, uh, it's going to be quite a, a small one because of COVID. Uh, so I think there'll be six of us. I think my favorite one was when we had 17 or 18 people and it, <laughs> everyone just descended on Dublin. But it, was, it, was, it, it wasn't stressful cooking for it, partly because my sister's a chef. So the two of us cooked together, drank a little bit too much champagne possibly. <laughs> But we got out a four course meal for 17 people from the age of three up to the age of uh, seven, 80, actually it would have been. But for me, that was more important. When I grew up, my mother had this, I thought at the time, awful habit of inviting anybody she thought was, hadn't got a Christmas dinner. So we had some of these dinners where you'd look at the people and say, who are these people? Not too many, but they were, they were the sort of people uh, who, who probably weren't going to have a decent Christmas dinner themselves. So we had quite a lot of that. We had a lot of, I grew up with my great uncle, my aunt lived with us. So they were always quite big affairs. Um, so f you wouldn't describe them as fine dining, but they were great fun. Um, 
family dining, I think that's sometimes as important as an experience. Yes. Yeah. Um, like well, I, I would say people do ask me about wine all the time. And I always say horses for courses. If you've got a gang of people coming in, like this 17, 18 people, get decent, cheap, easy drinking wine. If there's going to be six of you, I know I will open up some very nice wines this Christmas because my parents and all like a nice glass of wine, as does my son these days. So I'm quite happy to, to open up the finest uh, this year anyway. They'll have um, they'll have you sitting across the table to give give you your, to give them some advice. Um, yeah. Like actually, I might I might ask you some advice on that myself. Um, I had bought for my family for Christmas dinner this year. I'd got a bottle of Triple C, which is C. Yeah. wines. Um, and I wonder, you know, in preparing that to enjoy it with a meal, what would you do in terms of behaviours and activity? Well, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Triple C, uh, having tasted it a couple of times recently. It's, it's quite a, a closed, structured, tannic wine. What I would tend to do, well, at Christmas, I always bring out my decanters. And decanting a wine like that, I would probably stand it up 24 hours in advance. I would put it into a decanter probably about an hour before serving because by bringing it into contact with the air, you're gently, not oxidizing it, but oxidating it. So you're softening those tannins and you're bringing out the fruit. You're sort of prematurely aging it, uh, speed aging it, if you like. So if you're going to have it with your Christmas dinner, I think the three C's would go brilliantly with a rib of beef or goose, with turkey, the tannins you need to decant it but I, I i love the ceremony of christmas that i even decant my white wines into a decanter because good white wine will open up uh, and most people serve it far too cold anyway but i love the idea of just having decanters up and down the table there's a great um there's a great sense of ritual and of kind of spectacle to that it sounds it sounds like a beautiful way of kind of making the day that little bit special i think this year, probably more than we've realised in other years, we particularly want and need that kind of nice moment. Um, like I know one tradition that we have when you mention white wine is um, carrots roasted in white wine is to me a key moment in Christmas. Without it, it's just not um, it's not Christmas Day. And um, having I, I went through the uh, Bodega 695 website and just decided to pick a white wine to ask you to tell us a little bit about what you think you're sampling there um, and see what my pronunciation is like. So it's a Spanish white called uh, Pagos del Galera, which is a Valladoras. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that as a wine. Well, actually, you picked well because this is one of my favourite regions and grape varieties. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Spanish wine. In the last 15 years, every year, they're rediscovering old grape varieties, old areas that have been making wine for centuries, but we're only starting to learn about them now. And one of them is this. The grape variety is Godeo, down here, and the area is Valdeoras. Valdeoras means, it's up in Galicia, I should say, first, which is the top left-hand corner. It's the Donegal of Spain, and it actually is a very green area. It's not like the the sunny beaches we think of down in uh, Valencia and all along. It's, it's quite green, uh, red wine, they have problems ripening it fully, but white wines, they've got their own grape varieties. People, particularly those who've gone along the Camino de Santiago de Compostela, will go through Val de Oros, and then they'll go to Santiago where you have Albarino. Well, Val de Oros is more, I call it the Chardonnay of Spain, because it has this richness, it fills the mouth. Uh, and I think it's wonderful. It's wonderful if you're going to have mixed foods with a little bit of sweetness, like your roasted carrots. It'll go well with starters like uh, scallops and prawns. It'll also go very well with turkey and stuffing. But the Val de Oris means Valley of Gold, because the Romans discovered gold here and the Romans were very good at lots of things. They're very good at mining. Once they've mined all the gold, 
they planted vines. And this was the grape variety. And it almost died out in the 1970s. They were down to the last two or three hectares when a couple of uh, professors from the local university said, we've got to bring back our local grape. And nowadays, everybody wants it because it has this lovely, it, this one is on oak, so you get this lovely fresh fruit, but it's not zippy like a Sauvignon. It sort of fills your entire mouth with flavor and goes brilliantly with turkey. Um, I, I, I kind of, in this conversation, I find myself getting progressively more hungry listening to you talking. This is, um, and John, I, 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 I was, I clicked onto your website there earlier, just having a look through it in advance of this conversation. And um, in the about me section, one, one phrase that I, I kind of caught my attention was, um, you're talking about your career and your work, but you just mentioned in passing this phrase that John Wilson is a man who likes a glass of decent wine. Yeah. And well, you know, I think I, I know a lot of people get very intimidated by wine. And when you get people like me talking about flavors of licorice and sweaty armpits and whatever, they just get completely turned off. And I know they get, they, uh, people don't like going into wine shops because they're afraid they'll be talked down to. At the end of the day, wine is about sharing. It's about sharing food. It's about sharing company. And when you get company wine and people together, it actually doesn't matter how good the wine is, you're going to have fun. But if you can have a decent glass of wine as part of that, it makes a magical trinity of, of things going on. So I, I, I always try, particularly in my articles, my editor once sent me an email saying, John, I think you're getting a little bit academic there, which was her way of saying, uh, tone it down a bit, but I, I always hope that people can read the articles, get a little bit possibly of education, a little bit of fun and a bottle to go out and drink and enjoy. Sad thing is in Ireland, good wine is expensive, um, but it doesn't have to be that expensive. And I, just when you mention the articles that you write and, you know, the, the time that you spend hosting tastings and interacting with, you know, people like me who are just enthusiastic to learn, to figure out what we enjoy and I dare say to just enjoy a good glass of wine. And are there one or two key questions that you'll always receive without fail every time you host a tasting? I wonder if you might illustrate their responses to me. Yeah, well, people always ask me, I like this, I like this. is that all right? And you say, well, of course it's all right. Um, but I think people, get very confused by all the nomenclature and there's a huge amount of writing and there's a lot of legal stuff about wine um, because you have to do a certain amount and you're not allowed to write about all the additives that appear in wine. So I, I think people are, are getting more concerned about what they put in their mouth, both food, all sorts of drinks. And I think this is a fantastic thing we should be looking at the food we eat, we should also be looking at the wine we eat. And most of the questions come from that direction. They're asking about sulfur dioxide. They're asking about organic, biodynamic, natural wines. And I think these are all very valid questions. And I think, you know, we're looking at very positive changes in the wine business because we're seeing a lot more, a lot less intervention in, in making wine and in growing grapes. Okay, and that's, we did have the, um, on this web series a number of, got about two months ago, we had the Director of Sustainability within Santa Rita um, joined us on the evening. And it's fascinating to hear the extent that some of the wineries are actually going to and really taking it incredibly serious. As, and so it's, it's interesting to hear that the kind of the, that we as the consumer, our interest is the same in terms of wanting to focus more on kind of making informed decisions that way um, and kind of when you were talking there it just made me think I, I know that John you mentioned that you yourself started 
your career in the wine trade um, initially and you spent 15 years in the trade before you moved into your career as a wine journalist and I kind of I'm curious how your experience in the trade actually informs or has influenced your work as a writer or if it has. I I sometimes forget how much it has but I think it definitely has and I started work just around the corner from the Little Museum of Dublin in Mitchells of Kildare Street. Um, and I just got an email last night actually from Peter Dunn, who was my first boss, who many people will know. Um, and it was a great start in the business. But I think part of me is I can see, I mean, I, I worked for in various parts of the trade as a buyer. So I would be going and talking to producers and rather talking about the lovely slopes and biodynamic vineyards, you'd be talking about price and price and price um, because you had to be able to sell the wine. You had to get it at the right price. So there's a commercial edge. And I worked for Superquin for a while as a consultant, which opened my eyes to how supermarkets buy and treat wine. Um, so I like to think that I've seen the other side of it. So when people come up to me and say, I have a sample of this wine, it's great, John, you'll like it because that I've been there. So I have sympathy for a lot of them because going out and I worked as a salesman for a while and going out and selling wine is a, it's a very difficult thing to do. You have to be born into it. And I don't think I was born into it. Um, but I'm glad I had all that experience because it's quite, and you, you also learn that we wine writers can write about a certain wine and think this is amazing and brilliant, but the general public will di disagree with us completely. Um, so you have to actually write about wines that people like. So there are times when I have to bite my tongue. I mean, I, I freely admit I'm a little bit sick and tired of Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. I don't, there's some really good ones, but it is one of the best selling wines in Ireland. So other than to people who are on this Zoom at the moment, I would never, I would never go on and criticize Marlborough Sauvignon per se, because it is a good wine and people love it. So who am I to tell them that they, they can't drink it? Um, and then to ask you a bold question, um, if you had to choose a favourite grape variety, could you do that? Uh, possibly I could. Pinot Noir, red burgundy, which is 100% Pinot Noir, would probably be my, my all-time favourite. Uh, when you get them, it's... Uh, I, I think the best description I heard of them was, it's like the girl who had the curl right down in the middle of her forehead. Um, and when they're good, they are so very, very good. When they're bad, they're horrid. But uh, I love good Pinot Noir, not just from Burgundy. I'll drink, happily drink anyone listening from Martinborough in New Zealand, from Central Otago, from California and Oregon, or from Chile, who's making some amazing Pinot Noir. Um, so that would probably be my favourite. But there's very few wines I dislike, I have to say the process um one thing i i found um i particularly enjoy is listening to the words that yourself and some of your fellow wine writers use to describe different wines and um i the next wine that i'd picked out to ask you about um i i remember reading in a guidebook somewhere that it was a chunky red which i think <laughs> the word i just thought was so charming um so a contino which is a rioca reserva from 2016 and um, you know would you tell me a little bit about a wine like that sure well rioca and it's a reserva rioca reserva uh, rioca is we love rioca in this country we are the eighth largest consumers of rioca in the world which given our relative size is quite amazing and particularly around Christmas time, we drink a lot of it. But it actually is a very good choice to go with Turkey. The Contina has fascinated me for years. Um, it's made by a company called Kune, 
which is actually the Compañía Viticola de Norte España, CVNA, but it is still a single vineyard owned by a family. So they make this wine, which is the best possible traditional Rioja. And Rioja, what they, in Rioja, what they give you is ready aged wine. It's not like Bordeaux, where you're supposed to age it for 10 or 15 years. They age it for you. So a Reserva, the, the youngest Reservas you'll find are four years old. So they age it in barrels and they age it in bottle before they send it out into the market. So this has spent two years in French and American oak. So you get a light spiciness to it, but what you get is this lovely, smooth Tempranillo fruit because Tempranillo is the main grape variety here, um, which I find, I love it. I mean, I think it's a, it's a great wine and uh, um, yeah. Um, I think that in itself is, it's a great wine and I love it. I don't think you can ask for a higher recommendation than that. Um, I see a question that's come in from one of our attendees. Um, so uh, they're just wondering, John, do you run any courses online? I don't, actually, not yet. Well, I've been doing a lot of Zooms because of the year that we're in. But uh, I tend to, I come from a family of teachers. My father was a teacher. My two sisters were both teachers. And I've shied away from it. Um, I don't know why. I've never, just never gravitated towards it. So um, not yet is the answer, but maybe I should be. Yeah, I think, uh, watch this space, as they say. Um, then, John, I was wondering if you might do me a favour. Um, for the Irish Times subscribers who've joined us here this evening, in RSVPing to attend, they've all been entered into a competition to win a selection of wines from mm. Bodega 695, um, but also a membership to the Little Museum of Dublin and a few other goodies. Um, I've got the, um, the Irish Times has just confirmed to me in the last kind of couple of moments by message, the winners of the prize. I was wondering if you might announce them for me, if I privately send them over to you. Do that, yes. Well, thank you to the Irish Times subscribers who joined up for this. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, yeah. So the winner is our Hadril, Hazel Kinmouth, Kinmonth, sorry, and Patrick Kelly. And what do they get? They will get a selection of wines and a membership to the Little Museum. So um, Hazel and Patrick, we're going to be in contact with you directly to arrange getting delivery out to you, but that'll be something hopefully to celebrate the Christmas period. Um, and so, John, I kind of, I'm just, I'm kind of curious when you're talking about this relationship between the Irish public and wine kind of more generally, you know, it is, it, it, it's interesting that you kind of put across this point a couple of times that we kind of we use the word should I would think a lot yes and I kind of I wonder from the conversations that you have and the interactions could you give me a sense of not what we should be doing but what we actually as a collective seem to like like just give me a sense of the market sure. um I think um I, I could give you very crude dissection of the Irish market. Um, there are there is a group of people who who like Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. Um, uh, I think the most difficult one, I think, is the red wine drinkers, because everybody, because of they want to limit their alcohol intake, want lighter red wines, which means 12 and a half, 13 percent. But if you give them and I talked to Lynn Coyle in O'Brien's about this. If you give them a blind tasting, they always go for wines at 14, 14 and a half percent. And you cannot square that circle. So I like to think that we would like medium bodied wines, but I actually think the Irish palate is very adventurous and will try anything much more so than in the UK. And certainly much more so than places like France, where they, they're they even parochial in their area and they won't try anything. So we have a very broad palette. 
I think we like lighter, unoaked white wines, and I think we like medium to full bodied, smooth red wines. Um, but I do think we're, we're actually, as Irish people, we're quite good. I talked about being intimidating. Wine is a very complicated thing, but I think we Irish are very good at just saying, forget about that, let's just enjoy a glass of wine together. And that for me is absolutely everything wine is all about. So I think we're pretty good at wine. Yeah, I think it is kind of one ritual that I think I, I'm particularly looking forward to as this kind of, as we move through the pandemic, will be this opportunity to actually sit down and enjoy an evening with, you know, a good bottle of wine and some loved ones. And I know kind of from my own perspective, I often, in the back of my head, I don't like Chardonnay, but then I'll regularly walk into um, a shop and I find myself the uh, Medea Real Chardonnay is one that I seem to buy on repeat, despite the fact that I seemingly don't like Chardonnay. And this is a sentiment that I don't, I've heard other people say, so I don't think it's unique to me. Um, I wonder if you just talk to me a little bit about that as a grape. Well, I think, I mean, there is the ABC movement, which is anything but Chardonnay. Um, I think, you know, saying you don't like Chardonnay is like saying you don't like meat, um, which you may not do. Well, actually, you are a vegetarian, I think you don't. Um, but it's you just don't like that Chardonnay. There's all sorts of different styles of Chardonnay from huge, big, rich, oaky styles to fresh, light, crisp ones. And Chardonnay is one of the great, great varieties of the world. So I think uh, really what you, you need to do is try a few more Chardonnays. And if you're, you're trying the Medal, Medal Real, I think is an excellent Chardonnay. So, but every time people drink Chablis or Merceau or Macon, they're drinking 100% Chardonnay. So I think most people like it some of the time they just don't don't realize uh, that they like it yes somebody said i don't like chardonnay but i do like champagne because most champagne is made of chardonnay and pinot noir so uh yeah yeah it's the bubbles but um i see the lord mayor is about to join us now in a moment um which is wonderful and i guess um until she's joined us now momentarily um I'm here. <laughs> I'm perfect. Uh, no, it's um, John. I remember kind of when you and I had a quick catch up earlier on in the week. I remember you mentioning to me that your own education originally, you did a degree in history. Um, you got your mm -hmm. problem in history, so I would, I would dare say you're better educated for my job than I am. But um, I, I wonder if you might just give me a sense of. I'm just. It's something I'm always curious to hear and people and their backstories. You know, what were you setting out to do initially? Or did you have a sense of what your, your goals were back at that stage? No is the answer. Um, I, I've, I've always loved history. I did then and I do now and I still buy a lot of history books and read it. I think it explains people. It explains everything about us as a people. But wherever you go, you cannot understand politics, you cannot understand literature or anything unless you understand the history. So it's an interest in people gone past. I, I always was fascinated by it in school. And the reason I did it in college, I did history and politics, was it was the thing I was good at. And it avoided making a decision for another four years. So in fact, when I went there, there was an awful lot of early medieval history that I wasn't that interested in because I love modern history. The last 100, 200 years is where I, I get excited. But I still have to force myself to read novels because I can just read history books all day. Um, um, I think we all kind of have our, our particular reading vice. And I think kind of it's yeah. funny to hear you say that this idea of um, picking a history well, a degree because that was four years further than having to make that decision. Yeah. <laughs> I think my English degree is in possession for exactly the same reason. I would... <laughs> well, I, I feel very sorry for, for young people, and I have two children, um, having to make that decision again. Um, I still sometimes say to myself, when I grow up, I'll make a decision about what I've got to do. But uh, 
No, I, I mean, I have a fantastic job. I, I love what I do every day. Um, so I'm lucky. Something pretty special. It's, um, and Lord Mayor, are you joining us at this stage? I am. Oh, shit. Hang on one second. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was supposed to not be out loud. I'm trying to cook Alex dinner while uh, it is. Hang on. Yeah, it's on there. Hi. It's all good. Um, that is the, uh, the reality of live Zooming. Um, so, so everyone, our next guest this evening is the Lord Mayor of Dublin, Hazel Chu. Um, Hazel is a Green Party councillor, the 352nd Lord Mayor of Dublin, the ninth woman who's ever held the position and the first woman of colour, plus, if I'm totally blunt, one of the most tenacious, genuine, hardworking and lovely people that we've personally had the fortune of knowing in the Little Museum. So, Hazel, thank you so much for being here. I like to point out to people, she's only saying that because I know her, so, and she's a friend of mine. So, like, I'm wondering if we weren't mates, would, would I still get such a lovely introduction? Hi, everyone, and Merry Christmas. Uh, I am the 352nd Lord Mayor of Dublin City. I am uh, sitting on my floor at the moment uh, while also trying to wait for the food to cook for my uh, toddler while also in the other room, my other half is having a parliamentary party Zoom call. So this is how our household runs on a weekday now. It's a bit chaotic. So, uh, so yes, hi. I am. Um, I, I adore your honesty, and I think it's <laughs> sounds like a busy household. Um, and I, I think one thing I don't think I've asked you before. And I was curious, um, knowing that you were going to be here this evening, to ask. You know, when you took on the role of Lord Mayor, um, you obviously did so in the middle of a pandemic. So there was no precedent as to what your role should and could look like within the limitations of the pandemic. And I kind of wonder how you kind of found and adapted that role and what that was like as an experience. Uh, well, it, it's it's odd because recently someone had said to me, um, I, I think it was because we we were launching a campaign uh, with the IV Trust. Uh, I had just given back all the kegs here in the in the um, house, and we were down to the IV Trust because Diageo kindly donated uh, the keg money to them. And someone said, "Hang on, if you don't have kegs in the house, does that mean there's no events or anything?" And I kind of looked at them, going, "Well, there's there's no events, full stop." That's why I sent them back because there's like we can't have anything in here. And the, the next thing uh, that the the lovely woman said was, uh, "Well." That's a bit of a bummer. You you get to be the host of like the 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 best house in in the country and have so many parties because you do hear that you hear previous Lord Mayors having these wonderful events uh, and being able to engage the community and have everyone in here and you also hear the uh, um, <laughs> the colourful sc stories of how parties have run in here and she kind of said oh that's that's quite sad for you I'm <laughs> sure for one moment I actually went. Wow, she's right. It's and then then it dawned on me. It was it was that moment of oh my God, Hazel, cop the hell on. You're 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 the you're in the most privileged and uh, um, amazing position ever. It doesn't matter whether you have Lissy events at house or whether there are uh, uh, there are kind of events every day. The, the, the position in itself is that you represent the city and the position in itself is that you are representing the people. And I think so far we've done it quite well by changing it to that. So I've been quite lucky in so far that the chief executive uh, and his team have been very amenable in how this office has worked in terms of policy. I guess I'm also lucky in that I I, I chair a party, uh, uh, um, uh, political party. So I, I've always worked on the policy side as well as the organization side. So I knew what I could and could not do. And I also knew what I could and could not push. So setting up things like the homeless task force was something that not, not had been done before. There had been previous Lord Mayor forms on homelessness, but what we did was make it more structural, have it every week, have it that it was um, objective based. We met the minister with our ass and we we will, we will be pushing from there. So, so it became more, less about the ceremonial, more about the policy. So next year, it's going to be about the integration policy because one of my pillars was about fighting discrimination. So I've been, I guess, uh, 
I, I can't even call it unfortunate. There's nothing unfortunate for my position. It's been unfortunate how the year has run for so many. It's been so tough and challenging and so much loss and grief. But for me, I've been very lucky that even though the role changed massively, that I don't get the material stuff or ceremonial stuff, you get the stuff that's important. You get the stuff that you're you're supposed to be elected for, which is actually represent the people and, and try to, to, to support Dublin where we can. So. And I think, you know, speaking as the little museum of Dublin, I, I can't not ask you a history question when you find yourself, as you said, living in such a special and important Irish house and Dublin house. Um, like I think in taking on the role as the Lord Mayor, you accomplish something that so few people will in their lives. And I kind of wonder, you know, when you're walking through the halls and looking at these portraits of your fellow former Lord Mayors, you know, I wonder if there's any stories that you've been particularly inspired by, bemused by, or just made a good story about Dublin. Well, firstly, I well we go back to the massive honor point because, like, I come from I'm a second generation um, uh, in migrant family, and uh, I'm on a call, so and this is my daughter. She will be third generation. Uh, sorry, everyone. Um, and my mum would have come over here 40 odd years ago and she she was a dishwasher and a cleaner uh, working two jobs like she wouldn't for the life of her have ever imagined uh, coming over here broke looking for a job uh, living quite a few people in a house that her daughter will become Lord Mayor of, of Dublin so and um, this is then that proud moment and history made in my own personal sense. But then when we walk around the house, to your, to your point about history here, you, you get to appreciate, well, this is a massively significant thing. And you look at the portraits and you look at how each person ha, ha, has has kind of become that role. I guess for me, it, it's fascinating and, and uh, uh, amazing, but also it is slightly bemusing in so far there is no women portrait here. There is, um, of course, being uh, the fact that there's only nine female Lord Mayors. So uh, there is one female, uh, there was one female painting and I once questioned, oh, like, uh, like at the time I kind of knew it wasn't Kathleen Clark and I kind of went, oh, well, who is she? Like, and then someone had said, oh, she's just a friend of someone. And I got kind of dismayed by that until someone said, oh no, she was the lady mayoress back, back in, in the day. So I at least went, okay, okay, there, there, there's a position and a role there. But it, it made me realize this office is so historical, but that there's so much progress that can be made. Like I would love that in, I don't know, 20 years time, 50 years time, there is a painting of a female Lord Mayor. Like we're trying to get one for Kathleen Clark to be in Dublin City Council at the moment in, in the halls because every painting there again is uh, a male. And there's nothing wrong with having male portraits, but it, it is that kind of back to that line of you can't be what you can't see. And if we are going to show Dublin as a, as a um, city of diversity and inclusion, then we need to show that uh, we are we, we are diverse when it comes to gender, when it, we are diverse when it comes to everything else. And I think um, I, I couldn't agree more with you. And I, I see a comment here. It's just when I see that wonderful daughter of yours a moment ago, um, one of our attendees. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, beautiful it was lovely uh, one of our attendees had said thank you to the lord mayor for the christmas card that her mum received and ah. that was designed by your own um, your own little daughter and one thing i kind of would love to just get a sense of and i know you kind of touched on one or two of them already but just i'd love to know a little bit more about the key initiatives that you actually have commit to undertaking and kind of the the ambitions that you set out at the beginning of your time as lord mayor and kind of how they're going so the three things I, I decided to kind of uh, have three main things because I think with uh, a lot of previous Lord Mayors with the best will in the world with, with because you're being rolled out for 10 events a day you never actually get that key thing done so I was quite uh, I guess um, not lowering my ambitions I was very realistic in saying what well, these are the three things one 
is to fight homelessness. Two is to fight discrimination, uh, especially when it comes to racism, because that's quite personal. And then uh, three is to make sure we have a more sustainable city. So the first one, again, I, I went and set up the Homeless Task Force and made it in such a way that was a project um, and that it required project management. And every week I had some wonderful casters from each party, one from each party, and also the Dublin Regional Homeless Executive uh, meet for an hour, get, giving up their lunchtime every Friday to meet no matter what, uh, service users, service providers, and we, we then drew up a very common sense approach brief because we look at homeless and housing briefs and a lot of it is policy based and a lot of it doesn't apply in a tangible sense whereas you look at homelessness it's a crisis it's an emergency it needs really quite straightforward approaches to unblock certain things for example outreach we need increase of outreach workers that have uh, mental health and uh, drug um, addiction experience so that when they approach someone in the street, they can guide them in such a way to find shelter. We need key workers. So we need better protection for tenants uh, and tenants' rights so that people don't end up homeless. So so those were very common sense things. Now, the minister were, uh, was very supportive, but we need to keep on, we need to get back to him again. So, uh, so we, we hope that out of our five key recommendations and 20 more than further recommendations, there will be uh, matters that will be dealt with um, in the coming months. And then in terms of integration and discrimination, um, I guess my, like I've been doing a lot of talks, I've been tying in with a lot of the NGOs to make sure that we have, we fight what I call the good fight in pushing back discrimination uh, against, uh, um, against race, against religion, against gender. But the key thing that's missing in Dublin City at the moment is a coherent strategy. So we have an integration strategy that is uh, expired. And the previous one was good, but it sat on a shelf like all good strategies do. Uh, they sit on a shelf gathering dust. So we, I met with the team recently in DCC and they were very eager because we're hearing stories of families being chased out of communities and neighborhoods because of their color of their skin, because of their religion. So what we want to do is make sure we draw up a strategy that is fit for purpose on the ground. We're hearing of families that come to libraries to spend the day because they have nowhere else to go. Uh, as some families from different countries that just don't have the language and don't, doesn't have the support. So again, an integration strategy that will help people from ground up because that's really the first step to fighting discrimination. If you are constantly having to fight your, for your rights and not being discriminated against, then you don't have time for anything else. You don't have time to find the right job to support your family. And our, our position within DCC is to support you while you're trying to do everything else uh, when it comes to being uh, being included and being integrated in in a community uh, lastly is sustainable city we're, we're doing a lot of that at the moment because of COVID uh, I always load to talk about kind of opportunities within a crisis but especially with with COVID it's it's been such great loss and it's been such massive grief for so many but there has been that opportunity in terms of promoting more sustainable transport when it comes to cycling pedestrian when it comes to keeping safe but also when it comes to planning how the city works mm -hmm. we just kicked off the uh, um, we kicked off today actually officially the launch of consultation for the city development plan which is from 2022 to 2028 uh, that's the new plan that's going to come forward and the consultation period is on to the 21st of February and that's going to be really important because that shapes what our city will look like for the next five years and when we look at the city now we, we know it when we see it that without tourism without office workers it's this donut with a hole at the moment because everything's gone to the periphery what can we do to shape it that if there is touch wood another pandemic down the line or another crisis that we won't be the city won't be left uh, short and the people that have to work in the city and have to be supported by the city won't be uh won't won't, won't be left short as well and it's it's amazing to hear the kind of the breadth of and the number of issues that you are embracing and tackling and it's kind of it's heartening to hear of the progress that has been 
made so far and making sound recommendations and kind of just seeing what the next few months look like. And I think, you know, as you mentioned that this, we are living through a pandemic, there has been an incredibly tough year for all of us in different ways, but I kind of find my own personality, I always need to look for something to feel hopeful for. And I kind of, I wonder through your role as Lord Mayor, you must be meeting people at every corner of our city. And, you know, from the young children and the young people living in our society today through to all of us, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about the people you've met and, you know, what makes you hopeful as Lord Mayor? This is the, the, the thing. By the way, I'm just getting stuff out of the pot. This is out of the steamer. It is steam sea bass. Doesn't look that appetizing when it's in a place. Uh, but I like there's there's been a lot less uh, opportunity for engagement with the house clothes. But so we've flipped, flipped it a little, and we, we we've been able to try to engage in different forms via online, but also even in real life, real life, real person, I guess, we, we've done different things. And I guess the most hopeful ones is when, when I launch the school zones and meeting the school kids, when uh, I go to um, the men's shelter, uh, as I said, the Ivory Trust and, and meet people there. When this week we were looking, well, last week actually, we worked with the interfaith forum to bring different religion to the garden and celebrate them. And it's something that we wouldn't have actually done before in, in an odd way. We would have had different religions in the house. We would have had different kids in the house, but they would have been kind of a, a talk event or, or whereas this was more direct engagement because they were smaller groups. But it was also great to see how they've worked as well during the year and the challenges they faced during the year like talking to 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 the secondary schools and primary schools are actually quite the best fun because they 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 ask loads of questions and they have no qualms about what questions they ask you but they're also really inspiring because these are kids that have had to adjust massively to uh to the pandemic and they don't have the option of going out um, and going to, not going out, but going remotely uh, to their jobs. Uh, they don't get to see people in a different manner. They've had to be indoors and now they get to go see uh, their classmates, but then they don't get to hang around with them afterwards. So like it, it, it's quite refreshing and also inspiring to, to talk to, to a good few of them. I recently presented at a GAA, prominent GAA, uh, giving scrolls to some of the um, volunteers there. And they were, the volunteers I was giving scrolls to, uh, Lord Mayor Scrolls to, were teenagers. They were like from, I don't know, 12, 13, I think one of them was, to all the way up to 17. And they were amazing because they had given up their free time just to volunteer to help the GAA run, continue to run and continue to engage the kids because they knew that the kids needed some kind of outlet. And they were kids themselves, so or they were young people themselves. I hate to say kids in case I patronize anyone, but young people themselves. So like it's it, it, it's, it's really inspiring. And you meet all these people, the other, Again, groups that I've met and I found really inspiring are, um, funny enough, uh, breastfeeding mothers, which I know a lot of people kind of will wonder why, but I I was, uh, uh, I was I did not enjoy breastfeeding my child when I first started, and it was difficult, it was challenging, and I found it really lonely. But what I did find was that there were really good online supports in different forms, and those women, however, uh, didn't have a form kind of in a physical location. So what I've found talking to a lot of um, breastfeeding groups and mothers is that we need to create those spaces in Dublin and that's what we're going to do as well. And that was really inspiring because they, they whenever you talk about that subject, people kind of go, oh, it's a bit taboo, but there's nothing taboo about it. So if you're feeding your child. So, so it, it's great to be able to use the role to talk to people in that way that they become very open and honest with you and you're able to engage so yes yeah, sorry um, and i think kind of embracing the kind of the week that we're entering into now um the 
Mansion House and you and your role as Lord Mayor are presenting a particularly beautiful 12 Days of Christmas initiative. Um, we've watched a little bit of it. Uh, I think we watched the first three episodes in the, the lead up to this evening kicking off. So thank you for allowing us to do that. But I'd love you just to tell us a little bit about what the initiative is and what it's supporting. Oh, sorry. Someone's sock is wet. Hang on one second. It's awful. So, um, so the 12 Days of Christmas is because Normally here, we would have a series, as I say, uh, a plethora, a myriad of events, uh, especially at Christmas. You would have Santa, you would have carols, you have the crib, and then uh, you would have people collecting for the Mansion House Fuel Fund, which supports uh, charities like Vincent de Paul and Simon Community and uh, a, a whole load of other charities as well. And this year we were told oh hang on you can't have any of that so so when I when we were told two months ago we were there going sorry you just can't have any of that I uh said oh right what can we do and in fairness the HSE have been very supportive and engaging but they were a bit dumb going nothing I'm really sorry kind of way so so we started then planning and saying okay what can we do so we looked at the crib first and went right what if we kept the animals in clothes? Would that be okay? And funny enough, HSC said, yeah, okay. So uh, let's try it that way. And then we said, what if we recorded a series of people's uh, famous face, Irish faces, to, um, uh, telling the tale of the Christmas Carol and have the Dublin Gospel Choir singing on then uh, the footsteps of, of the mansion house and it's all recorded and streamed. Would that be okay? And they said, yeah, as long as everyone's socially distanced and, and adhering to the rules. And and we, we did that. So every night at seven o'clock since Sunday, what we would do is stream out a new chapter of the Christmas Carol and end it with then uh, the Gospel Carol Choir. And it's to just give someone people, uh, families, singles, everyone, just a bit of a feel good factor, but also to let them know here, that there are charities out there that all need your help. There's this one here with the Mansion House Field Fund, but others that need your help, please support and think about, uh, uh, think about, sorry, think about their community and think about uh, everyone else. And it, it was, it was funny, it was an odd project because the 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 key of the project was being able to rope enough famous faces and say to them, "Hey, how's it going?" So normally we would invite you in for probably pints and and dinner to say thank you if you can do this. Now we just need you to do this and record this and <laughs> and that's it. And in fairness to them, they were all so nice. The people so far. Uh, Lisa Hannigan, uh, PJ Callagher, Ray Darcy, they've been brilliant. And then coming up, we have uh, Senator Lepau, Denise Chyla, Brent, uh, Bernard Brogan, Jamie Heasley, Bernard Cowan, Ryan Andrews. I'm trying to think who else. There, there's a few more as well. And and every, and it again shows that Christmas spirit of people willing to participate in things like this. Um, then on the last day, we, well, on uh, 25th, which isn't, the last of the 12 days, but Christmas Day itself, we will be feeding the homeless here on the four courts with the Knights of Colin Banners uh, because they normally would have been at RDS, but unfortunately, um, we can't get them bussed out and we can't transport people out. The RDS would have still been a good ventilated place, but logistically, it proved impossible. So we will be doing a service here from the four court and hopefully setting up some tables and chairs and, and seeing how we go on the day. That's wonderful. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, really wonderful initiative and it's fair play to you for making it possible and kind of doing so safely within the kind of the limitations that we're living through. Um, I did, I found listening to the choir the first evening, the moment of uplift that I didn't know I needed, but really, really did. So I thank you for that. Um, I They're really brilliant singers. That's the thing I miss. Like, I, I think a lot of people miss the culture, the 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 music, the the and like, and even that day when we were filming, I I remember bringing Alex back from Gresh, and she just said, "Oh, mommy, singing," and it was just nice to even hear music like that on the street again. And I, it's going to be such a tough Christmas for everyone, but I think when when you're alone, elderly being able to hear something nice uh, being able to to watch a piece of reading and music and if you're a kid as well that i think that that was that that was what we were aiming for that it would be a bit of an uplift yeah, and i think kind of when we speak about uplift we're kind of we're approaching the end of this evening so 
I think what I'd love to ask both of you really, and John, I'd invite your kind of thoughts on this as well. Um, like one thing I'm thinking about an awful lot recently is this idea that, you know, 2020 has been a challenging year and we are on the cusp of a new year. There's a lot to be hopeful for and kind of to push towards in the month, months ahead. And I kind of wonder if you both could kind of tell me what, may, what traditions you're looking forward to, what your opportunities Kind of what you feel optimistic towards in the future, what you feel hopeful towards. Well, I, I you know, I, I prefer to look at the positive. Uh, and there's been a lot of, you know, very depressing things about the last year. But I think we've also learned a lot about the basic things that are important to us, our friends, our family. Uh, even if you're at home, just going, I go for a walk along the seafront every morning. It means more to me than any fine dinner or anything like that. So it also has proven to me the things I don't miss. I don't miss a lot of these fancy dinners and tastings and things like that. You don't really actually need these to function in your jobs. What you need is your family, your friends, um, and a few basic things in life. And I, I know I've, I've probably had it fairly easy compared to other people, but uh, those are the things I will take from 2020. Yeah, I think, well, sorry, I, I, I was going to wait until John finished. Um, I think like family is a big one. So, um, but then even people I know who don't have family, what they found is community is a big one. And and it, it, in a year like this, and I, I kind of seen it in a different, uh, in a way with Hong Kong, my, my dad it lives in Hong Kong and he moved back a while ago and he lived in Hong Kong during SARS. And SARS was a lot lower number in deaths, but it was still terrifying nonetheless because it affected so many of them. But what I noticed straight afterwards and during SARS in Hong Kong was this sense of community, this sense of camaraderie and this sense of hope, and it, uh, but also mourning as well. So, so you have that odd balance of on one hand you're hope you're hopeful and happy for for what you have but on the other hand you're you're grieving and you're really quite depressed about where, where the state of things are so and it's that same thing I can see here now because with the vaccine coming and with announcement of the rollout and how things are people do feel this sense of hope and they do feel that things will get better but it won't be easy and none of this I think has has been easy this year but we oh, but it has been something that I think we should be incredibly proud of as well. There has been so many setbacks and so many challenges, but as a nation, we, we really did do our best and we did well. Now, I'm sure lots of people would say to me, oh, you, you can't say that, especially in light of the loss. But but I I would always say we, we have to give ourselves time to grieve and mourn the people we lost but we also have to give ourselves time to uh to say to each other that we have done well as a country and that we still are a community and continue with that spirit of community like i'm really quite grateful for the fact that i i i have the people around me so i i i, I even though i haven't seen my friends in quite a while and my aunt has hasn't stepped foot in this mansion house i'm quite glad that they're still around so uh where they are so and that's what we uh, to john's point it's not the glitz and the glamour it's very much the the, the, the now and the people and uh, what you have in front of you rather than what you could have and what you did have, so. Yeah, I think this kind of sense of community that you both reference and speak about, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I know in the Little Museum, we found a huge sense of gratitude and appreciation for the community around us, both of yourselves included. And now that we kind of have come to the end of the evening, um, I kind of hope you might just indulge me for just to say thank you to that community for one moment. Um, this is the 28th episode of this series that we have done so far this year since the pandemic began. And it really has 
been one of the highlights in the little museum. So to you both for participating and to every speaker who has, we really so appreciate it. Um, a colleague of mine, Fiona Brennan, has made the whole thing possible. And I really can't stress how much I appreciate that. To Santa Rita and Bodega 695 for making it possible. The support of that has been really quite incredible to the Irish Times for organizing this evening. But I really think the people that we're most grateful to are the attendees and the people who've shown up to one event or every week without fail. Having your company and having you here has really, it's meant so much to us in the Little Museum. So sincerely, thank you all so much. Um, John Wilson, Lord Mayor Hazel Chew, it's been really lovely talking to you both. I so sincerely appreciate you taking the time um, and to everyone here this evening, I hope you have a really safe and nice Christmas and we will see you back in the new year. So to everyone, happy Christmas. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.